You know how smallish towns have this kind of mythology about them? Well, I guess maybe you don't. I'm not too old myself, but I've been around long enough to see it plainly. And for most people, those little tales or rural legends are just that. Like, every small town probably has a well where there's a ghost inside it. Growing up, you probably avoided that well at all costs. Pretty smart ploy, right? Or maybe there's part of the woods that we must always steer clear from. Oh, and this is the best one. Every small town has an old lady that's a witch, without fail. As a kid, she's the old lady that doesn't talk much, that moves slow, and hardly comes out of her house, etc, etc. Well, my town has a lot of these little legends too, and the older you get, the less interesting they become. I was probably 12 or so when I started realising that most of them are just little cautionary tales, and without even thinking about it, I would repeat them to younger kids around me, like an evolutionary meme or something. Little fibs that keep the kids out of trouble. But even so, some of those tales stick around. And the big one in our town was about the visitor. Growing up, I always believed it wholeheartedly. And even when I got to my early teens, I remember thinking it was probably fake. But the adults around me just kept insisting over and over again. This one had to do with our mayor, Mayor Blind. He was quite an old man, pushing 80, but in good spirits, he loved to tell the tale. What struck me about it though, is that even to adults he would repeat this, and unlike most tales, this one had a firm ending. There was a due date, so to speak, and that due date was Thanksgiving in the year of 2018. It was on that day in 1958 when Mayor Blind wasn't Mayor Blind yet. He was just Bill Blind, a young kid working a summer job at our local hotel and received a call from the front desk. They called him B back then and he'd just gotten out of school and was looking to make a few extra bucks so that he could save up for his first car. The way he tells it, the phone rang and he picked it up. He expected that there might be a service call since it was approaching midnight, but he was surprised to hear an unfamiliar woman's voice on the other end. This is the summer inn, how can I help you? He asked in his characteristically cheery tone. The voice on the other end was serene and charming. Lively but sophisticated, he used to say to whoever would listen, and it requested a reservation. Bill flipped open the booking folder and scoured it in a hurry, but this was high season. There wasn't anything available for weeks. He delivered the news to the person on the other end of the call and apologised. The summer was in full swing, he explained, and the hotel wouldn't have vacancies for another two months. But the voice wasn't disparaged in the slightest. It requested merely a reservation on Thanksgiving, it said, and that it was certain there would be an opening. Why, of course, Bill responded quickly. That's far away enough, Miss, um, a call. The voice oozed soothingly. Day a call. Bill stuttered, trying to reproduce the name, but it was so far on that he had a hard time with it. Okay, Miss Ock, uh, Miss, uh, for how many days? One night, the voice said back quickly, almost eagerly. He penciled it in and said that they were good to go. The room would be ready and he looked forward to seeing her. It won't be for some time, I'm afraid. The voice interjected. I need the room for Thanksgiving 2018. It didn't compute with Bill. I'm sorry, I don't know that area code. You were trying to reach the summer inn in Vaysville, right? 
the year 2018, Mr. Blind, for an 8pm check-in. The voice now stated firmly. According to Mayor Bill, he doesn't remember the rest of the conversation, nor, according to him, does he ever recall ever giving the mysterious Miss a call his name. But nevertheless, being young and conscientious, he did in fact make a note on the booking folder that there had been a reservation for the year 2018. Yes, 2018. Yes, 60 years in the future. He was the laughing stock of the town for doing so. He was called gullible and dumb by most of his peers, and for years the town would tell the story of the young, doe-eyed Bill Blind, who took the crank call of the century and still didn't live it down. And the years passed. Bill grew into adulthood, married twice, his first wife passed early, had four children who were by now old men in their own right, and in his mid-thirties ran for mayor and lost. But Bill had no quit in him, and that's something everyone agreed on. He ran in every mayoral race until, at the ripe old age of 60, he won. He would joke that it took a generation to die that remembered his whole fiasco with Missacol before he found enough voters to support him. And he was a marvellous mayor. He was loved by all. He was sweet with both children and adults. And, in his old age, found himself repeating his story about Miss Cole more and more. She was the reason, he would always say, that he never did get that old Chevy he was gunning for. He had such a hard time getting work after his summer at the hotel, that by the time he had enough money saved for a car, he had to put it in his family and toward buying a house. That old 56 Chevy that he longed first as a pipe dream, and then as a goal, and finally as a failure, was something that he'd relegated to a youthful fantasy that went unfulfilled. And here we were, the whole town, and it was 2018. My blind story became more and more relevant as each month crept forward. Soon it was summer, and it was the talk of the town. What will happen on Thanksgiving 2018? Nothing, most people would exclaim. But what if somebody shows? Nobody was more excited than Mayor Blind. He didn't have much time left on this earth, and he joked that if somebody did in fact come, he could die happy. After all, that one phone call seemed to dictate his life. It pushed him away from his sought-after Chevy toward a woman that he loved more than a world. It gave him four kids he never thought he'd have. He never did plan on marrying as a young man. It gave him resolve and resilience, so much so that he never quit something he started. And that resolve turned into mayorship, a mayorship he was quite proud of and that we all earnestly benefited from. By November of last year, the Summer Inn, which, believe it or not, still in existence, extended an offer to Mayor Blind. He was without wife, both had passed by now, and his children had families of their own, and it had been his custom in recent years to take his Thanksgiving holiday at a different family's house each year. His popularity meant he had no lack of invitations. Come to us, the hotel told him. Come stand at that old front desk, the very same desk he stood at 60 years ago, at 8 o'clock. And after that, have a nice dinner with the hotel staff in the lobby. The offer was too good to be true, Mayor Blind said, and accepted eagerly. Would he be made the laughingstock again? It couldn't be. He was too loved at this point. And so, people planned to come line up at the hotel on that very Thanksgiving, so that he might not feel let down if nothing happened. And so, it was on the third Thursday of November, last year, about half the town decided to have their dinner early, 
so that they could come watch the summer inn by 8pm. My parents and myself were among the onlookers. My mom, she felt like it was like a huge waste of time. But my dad's a huge softie. And he felt like the story was so romantic that he had to see it to the end. After all, even since he was a kid, he'd heard the story. Imagine that for a moment. There are people in my town that were born, lived, and died within the time frame of this story. People who their whole life, when each little legend of our town became less magical, had this to hold on to. It was a spectacle. We stood there. I remember clearly, as the clock ticked along toward eight. It was about a quarter to when I stopped feeling my toes from the cold, and the sea of people shivered, almost in unison. A gentle snowfall began, and as people looked eagerly up and down the street that had led to the summer inn, we didn't see so much as a single headlight. All the sane people are in their warm homes eating dinner, my mom quipped. Who wants to be normal, honey? My dad shot back, and I smiled. And then the clock struck eight, and the road was dark as ever. People began muttering, not out of anger, but rather a slight disappointment. It was the result everyone expected, but nobody wanted. The crowd grew restless, and some people started meekly shuffling away. But far away, all the way down that street, a slight glimmer started to fade into view. With each second, it grew brighter, and as it rounded the bend down the road, two yellow headlights emerged. Everyone stopped and stared. It couldn't be, they thought. But the lights grew brighter and brighter as the seconds ticked on, and a faint sound of an engine, a loud, choppy engine, started to be heard clearer and clearer. As it was a hundred yards or so away, we saw a glimmer in the moonlight of long, sleek black paint, and as it passed into the crowd, we got our glimpse at the car and its inhabitant. It was a long, black, 56 Chevy, pristine. The car was like out of a museum. Through the slight glare of the window, we could make out the head of a young woman. A woman who couldn't have been older than 30, with a teal shawl wrapped around her neck. She drove past us, not for a moment taking a long glance or even acknowledging the crowd that seemed to be poised to greet her. The car pulled into the parking lot of the summer inn, and with a grace that you don't see people move at much nowadays, the young woman got out and walked into the lobby. The woman was magnetic in every sense. I remember I'd just watched Breakfast and Tiffany's a couple of months prior to that night, and I was struck at how much she resembled Audrey Hepburn. I told my parents that I had to see what was going on and snuck away. The crowd stood, transfixed, as I weaved through it. It was as if people were in such shock that they'd frozen. Might have been the weather too, truth be told. I like to think, though, that most people, except for selfish me, didn't want to interrupt a moment so long in the making. A moment that Mayor Blind had waited for, for over 60 years. A moment that had, according to him, set in motion a series of events that he believed dictated his entire life. I snaked my way over to the lobby, where I saw Mr. Blind standing at the desk with a tear in his eye. In front of him stood a young woman, and while she was saying something to him that I didn't hear, I saw that he was almost as surprised as everyone. A moment passed, and the two of them sat down together. I took a seat near them, and for the first time got a glimpse of the woman. 
She saw me, in fact. Her eyes met mine, and she was gorgeous and refined. She had a timeless beauty, the kind of beauty you see in the greats, the Audrey Hepburns, the Rita Hayworths, the Clara Bowes of the world, and she didn't seem to mind in the slightest that I had taken a seat just a few feet from them. The adults from outside still stood there, and even the waitstaff tried their best not to enter the lobby, likely out of respect for the mayor to have his moment. But there I sat, the stubborn 16-year-old that decided I was going to get the end of this story. I... I can't believe you came. I remember Mayor Blind repeating over and over. The woman was charming and sweet. They talked for about two hours. It was almost like an interview. She asked him about the night, and he told her everything. He told her how that phone call had hurt him, and how it propelled him into a relationship that was wonderful, and gave him children and a resolve to never quit, and how he even credited becoming the mayor to the life lessons he learned from that evening. He told her of the Chevy that he'd abandoned ever trying to buy, and how he realized that it was just a bit trinket, and that the real things in life are family, pushing yourself, being the best you can be. She sat there and listened to it all, and smiled and laughed at even the corniest of jokes. And when he'd finished telling her about everything and paused, she looked at him warmly and spoke. Is there anything else you'd like to tell me? She asked kindly. That's about it, Miss Oc... Oc well, sixty years, and I haven't gotten that name down. She smiled, and Mayor Blind slumped back in his chair and closed his eyes as if asleep. The woman gingerly reached for her bag, stood up, straightened out her dress, and started walking away. She passed right by me, and as she did, she paused and looked me right in the eye. Who says death is a mean bag of bones? She asked and smiled. Before I could respond, she walked away, got back into that old Chevy and drove back up the road she came from. The town coroner said Mr. Blind died of a heart attack, and the woman, Miss Cole, hasn't been found. Police did try to locate her, but I doubt they'll find her. I doubt anyone will ever find her. That is to say, I doubt anyone will find her when they're looking. But I think... We will all meet her someday. Growing up with a sleepwalker in the family gets old pretty fast. At first, everyone is a bit concerned that they'll hurt themselves or wander out of the house. These fears aren't unwarranted. The sleepwalker isn't aware of their actions, and everyone else is usually, well, asleep. We only discovered that my little brother was an apparent sleepwalker when we kept waking up to all of the doors and windows open in the morning. Since we live in a rural area, this wasn't too much of a danger, beyond potential wild animals roaming in. Still, as the older sibling, my parents designated me as the official keeper of my brother's actions. We shared a room, you see, and they wanted to use that to my advantage when it came to retrieving and sending my brother back to bed. The common saying of, don't wake a sleepwalker, isn't as big of a deal as you think. As long as you wake them gently and they're aware of their condition, they're not going to hurt themselves or be startled. Why would they be? They've just woken up after all. First, we tried bells on the door. When that failed to wake me up, my parents tried leaving plastic sheets on the floor. 
We tried just about everything you could possibly think of to try and alert me when he got up. And that was when my father came up with the idea of a string. Every night, my brother and I would tie a long string to our wrists and go to sleep like that. If he got up at any point, the tugging of him exiting the room woke me pretty quickly. It was a harmless, noiseless, flawless plan that had me bringing my brother to bed long before he opened our home to the elements and animals outside. You get used to it. The string, the tugging, retrieving the sleepwalker, and putting them back to bed. Some nights he would get up more than once, and others he wouldn't sleepwalk at all. Either way, that was the only variance in an otherwise rigid routine we had. There was no spooky words out of his mouth during his sleep, no strange place he kept going back to, and no motive behind opening the doors and windows. When asked, my brother simply stated that his dream was unrelated, and he didn't know why he would open the home. This went on for the better part of a year, before finally dying down. We gradually stopped tying the string to our arms before sleep, because my brother stopped getting up. One night in late July, I remember going to bed a bit earlier than usual after we took a trip down to the river for the day. Naturally, I was exhausted from an afternoon of paddling against the current and running around the nearby park with other kids my age. At some point during the night, I woke up, having become a very light sleeper thanks to my duty as watchful eye over my brother in the last year. I remembered feeling hot and sticky thanks to the humid weather. Getting up and opening the window, flipping the fan on and hoping that some air circulation might help. But when I turned to go back to bed, I saw my door was cracked open about two inches wide. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I realized there was something else as well. A face. Just beyond the threshold of the door, a small, pale face was pressed up to the crack. One big brown eye staring in at me lazily. My fear turned to frustration in an instant when I realized I was looking at my brother, who was standing completely still outside the door and more than likely sleepwalking again. With a deep breath, I gathered myself and grabbed the door handle. Go back to bed. Jesus Christ, can't you be normal for one night? And then I slammed the door shut and returned to bed. It was mean, but I was getting tired of it, you know. After a long day, I just wanted to sleep. And if he was just going to stand out there all night, then it wasn't my problem. The next morning was nothing special. Mum made breakfast, and we sat down at the table and I noticed my brother wasn't up yet. That was weird. He was always an early riser and eager to greet the day. I'm guessing Joe is sleeping in today? I asked, idly picking and stabbing at my waffles. My dad set down his coffee and looked up from his paper, his brow crinkled in confusion. Joe went to stay at Andy's house last night, he said. Then slowly, his face softened again, and he chuckled. You went to bed early, so you couldn't know. Suddenly, I wasn't very hungry. My stomach flipped, and my throat felt tight. When did he go? Shortly after you went to bed, when we got back. I didn't tell my parents what I saw worried that maybe something was now wrong with me. Instead, when my little brother came home later that day, I elected to reinstate the string system, just as a precaution. Joe seemed confused, but was compliant, joking about how we're tied together forever. It was a strange comfort in a way. The string was reliable, predictable. And that it was. For the next few months, 
Joe and I both slept soundly, with few sleepwalking incidents. I was thinking about dismissing the string again, but decided that just one more night wouldn't hurt either of us, just to make sure he wasn't getting up and wandering off. And it had become a source of a handful of inside jokes for us. Sibling bonding time, that kind of stuff. I think we both almost slept better when it was on as well. I woke up to a harsh tug on my arm quite suddenly. It was pitch black, besides my alarm clock nearby, which read the time at 2.25am. That wasn't the usual time Joe got up if he did sleepwalk, but variations could happen, and with a sigh, I began to throw my covers off and slide out of bed. That was when the second hard yank on the string nearly sent me tumbling to the floor, and I found my anger welling up pretty quickly. I thought he must have gotten the stupid string caught on something and was trying to pry himself loose. So I collected myself and hurried towards the door that was already open. That was when I noticed something was wrong. The string was only long enough to keep us maybe five feet apart at the most, but this string was longer and pulled taut down the hallway and around the corner. Joe? I called quietly. This didn't feel right at all, but I made my way down the hall and turned the corner just in time for a third tug on the string. It was leading into the kitchen, which featured a door to the basement that was now wide open as well. The string was descending into it, and the tugging beyond it was growing more intense, impatient. This wasn't like Joe at all. He'd never gone into the basement before, let alone manually pulling on the string. Joe? Are you awake? This isn't funny. I was louder this time, inching towards the open door as the string began to frantically vibrate and yank, as if urging me further. The closer I got, the more excited it grew. And when I reached the doorway, the next tug was so harsh that I almost lost my balance again. There was a lull in the tugging when I heard a door opening behind me, the bathroom across the hall from my room. A bleary-eyed Joe stepped out and blinked, one hand rubbing his eye as he yawned. There was no string on his wrist. Suddenly, the string began to pull with a force stronger than before, making me stagger out onto the first step leading into the basement with a yell. Joe seemed to realize that I had the string on my wrist, and he didn't, and that whomever or whatever was in the basement was not him. There was a roar of noise, a low moaning from the darkness of the basement, and my little brother's frantic footfalls behind me as he ran his way over and grabbed my free arm to hold me while he scrambled for something to cut the string. I heard the kitchen drawers clashing open as he searched, and then he produced a knife, one shaky hand soaring at the string as the noise in the basement became so loud it seemed to reverberate through our bones. And then, the dogging stopped. The string snapped away, and both Joe and I fell backwards onto our asses, sprawling over the kitchen floor. The noise ceased when the string was cut, and the basement door wobbled violently before slamming shut in our faces. Going to sleep after that was impossible, so Joe and I huddled up on my bed and sat with every possible light on in our room until the sun rose and our parents got up. Naturally, they didn't believe us, saying they hadn't heard a thing and slept soundly. They said that we must have hallucinated together or both been sleepwalking even. Either way, I know that whatever was in the basement was not my brother, and 
I've refused to tie the string to my wrist ever again. It was a lull in the Wednesday workflow at the bar, bored out of my wit's end, tapping the counter and counting the minutes before my shift was finished. It wouldn't have been all that bad if I hadn't left my phone at home. C'est la vie, I guess. It was 3am by the time I reached home, and exhaustion hung on my eyelids like a paperweight. As I walked down the hallway of my apartment complex, eager to see myself to bed, I noticed that the front door was slightly ajar. Light beamed through the crack into the darkened hallway. I hesitantly moved closer and listened. No noise other than the flickering of the broken fluorescent tube that hung above. I peered through. My heart felt like it was beating in my throat and my vision rumbled with pressure. Damn, I wish I had my phone, I thought. I watched and waited. I could see clearly into the sitting room, but I couldn't see any movement. I called out to my roommate. Daryl? I paused. You in there? I'm here, he called back. A sigh of relief washed over me, and I made my way inside. You left the door open, I called out again, while setting my bag down and collapsing on the sofa. Sorry, he shouted out from his room, the door of which was shut. Aren't you doing the night shifts? Sick. Oh damn, want me to get you anything before I go to bed? Nah. Daryl was never the most talkative but during the very rare occasions our shifts lined up, he was always there to greet me when I got home from work. He also had a penchant for over-exaggerating, a bit of a melodramatic. It's the man flu, he'd commonly say. It's allergies, I'd often reply while handing him antihistamines. I shrugged my shoulders and decided that sleep was well-deserved for the both of us and went to bed. That night, I was plagued by nightmares. Horrific things clad in shadows, with giant maws for mouths, and long spindly, dagger-like fingers. They chased me, hunted me relentlessly, always at the cusp of my heels as I tried to get away. I felt like I was running through water, struggling, panting, with an overpowering stench of rotten egg assaulting my nose. They howled my name over and over until finally I awoke in a puddle of sweat. The room was pitch black, with only a little moonlight seeping through the curtains for illumination. I sat up to try and calm my rapid breathing and reached for the bedside table to turn on the lamp. Just before my fingers pulled the cord, a loud crash of something being dropped came from the foot of my bed. I jolted my eyes across, and her silhouette of a man stood there, frozen in place, watching. Sorry, it spoke. Daryl, I cried out. The hell are you doing in here? Looking, he replied. Get the hell out, I yelled, throwing a pillow at him. He bolted out of the room and closed the door behind him with a thunderous bang. Fear replaced with ire. I tried to settle back into bed and closed my eyes, resisting the urge to look over my shoulder every few minutes. I noticed that the air seemed clearer, easier to breathe. It wasn't as heavy in the lungs, and I realized that when I woke, the smell of rotten eggs had still lingered for a time, eventually passing. The next morning, I decided to confront Daryl about the night before. Although we were close, I felt this was a massive overstep in personal boundaries. 
regardless of how long we've lived together. I knocked on his door. You awake? I asked. No response. I tried another knock. Nothing. I coughed, quickly noticing a slight hint of rotten egg. It was permeating from his room, seeping into the air around me. It was faint, but enough to make me uncomfortable. I tried opening his door. Locked. I knew he worked nights. I would often sleep during the day, so I wasn't immediately panicked. But I couldn't help but shake the feeling that something was wrong. I grabbed my phone. Hey, can we talk? I messaged him. Sure, what's up? He responded almost immediately. At this point, I was furious. He was awake, but obviously avoiding me. So I thought. Can you come out to talk? Uh, no, I'm out of town. Since when? Yesterday, I called to tell you about this last night. I was confused. We never talked, I thought to myself. I quickly checked the call log on my phone, and sure enough, there it was. Yesterday, 9pm. Duration, 4 minutes and 6 seconds. There was no doubt about it. He did call me, and the phone was answered. My legs felt weak, and fear filtered through my veins slowly, undulating with each heartbeat. That couldn't have been right, right? I was at work, surely. Are you sure you spoke to me? I frantically responded. I waited, my eyes locked on the phone for him to respond. After what seemed like an eternity... Absolutely. Is everything okay? My heart dropped to the pit of my stomach. Then, that same smell of rotten eggs blanketed the room, suffocating, burning the back of my throat. I felt like I was going to croak. I quickly turned my head to Daryl's door and found it, slightly ajar. I got up to look closer. It's then when I noticed that looking back was the eye of someone watching me, peeping from behind the door. I didn't have time to think. I didn't have time to ask questions. My body took control and I ran. In my sudden sprint, my phone slipped out of my hand, but I didn't look back. I didn't want to see whatever was in there. I bolted from my room. I could hear it crashing through the sitting room as it gave chase. I slammed the door behind me, putting all my weight against it. It tried the handle, slowly, then in quick successions yanked against the door, nearly launching me across the room. It didn't make a noise. It was silent, except for the constant thumping against the door. I sat and waited and cried. It went on for hours, relentlessly. I'm not sure when it stopped. The beating against the door slowly turned into monotonous white noise, and I just sat, staring at a wall, for hours on end, waiting. Until it just... vanished. A knock on the door broke me from my trance-like haze, Police, is anyone there? Someone called through the door. I didn't respond. It could mimic me. It could mimic Daryl. It could mimic them. We've been called in for a wellness check, they continued. Go away! I screamed. Are you safe? I won't let you trick me, I cried out between tear sudden yells. I heard a thundering thump against the door, the same as before, the bang rattling through my ears and jolting me forwards. Thump. The doorframe cracked from the immense force. Thump. I could hear a door handle on the other side cripple and fall to the ground with a loud rattle. 
thump. I quickly moved to the other side of the room, fearing that the door would topple down on top of me. Thump. As if in slow motion, the door came gliding downwards, before landing in an explosive burst of wood chipping and dust against the floor. Standing before me were two officers. Much of what happened next was a blur. I broke down in tears while being cradled by one of the officers. The other checked out the rest of the apartment to ensure I was safe. Apparently, when I hadn't responded to Daryl, he got worried and called the police to check up on me. I remember vividly the second officer came back into my room, his face pallid with fright. You should check this out, he said, gesturing for his partner to follow. They both left the room. Ah, oh, what is this? It stings! The second officer yelped from outside. Curiosity got the better of me and I had to see for myself. I found the two officers stood at the entrance of the tower's room. The door was wide open. I hovered over one of their shoulders to peek inside, and I nearly gagged. There was this yellow-like substance, like custard, stuck to the walls and ceiling in large globals of goop. It dripped to the floor in long, stringy spats with an overpowering, wretched stink of rotten eggs that penetrated the back of our throats, causing us to gag and keel over. They quickly closed the door again and we walked out. They were never able to find the guy. I never went back to that apartment, moved back in with my parents and spent months in therapy. It took me a year and a change of cities before I was able to find the courage to get my own place again. I made sure I lived alone this time. I thought I was safe. Never had an instance like it since. That is, until last night. It was crossing on midnight, and I was in a sleepy haze, drifting in and out of consciousness. Just before I fell into a deep sleep, I felt a pressure on the side of the bed, like someone had sat down on the edge, slowly, as if not to disturb me. That wretched egg smell filled the room instantly. I had my back to it, and I couldn't bring myself to turn. I was crippled with panic, fear. At that moment, I fully believed I was going to die. I could feel shuffling on the bed, the dips and bumps as it got closer, putting its full weight on the bed. Its breathing was erratic and had a gravelly sound to it. I could hear it, right up against my neck, like someone was breathing through a can of stones. It never touched me though. It just lay there, unmoving, I assume watching. I kept my back to it, my eyes on the wall, hoping that as long as it believes I'm asleep, it won't hurt me. By the time sunrise came, it was gone. Will it come closer? A boy in a purple raincoat was tugging on the edges of my jacket, his wide eyes hoping for a yes. A pluming spray bounced off the surface of the water, and I saw a familiar flash of grey. That's Eska. She's always been shy, but don't worry, she'll follow us for hours. The kid looked down and thought for a moment. How can you tell it's her when she's so far away? He asked, and I realized I'd never thought about it. She'd always been there. I wondered if she was curious, if she thought we'd feed her, or if she thought the boat was a strangely shaped whale from her pod. She's a regular around these parts, 
Esker's been here longer than I have. I was cut off by the loud splash of a tail hitting the water and I heard the excited yells of the tourists as their cameras clipped. Show off, I muttered under my breath and smiled. I had a beer in the local that night. The familiar tinny songs from the jukebox played in the background. Roberta, the girl I was drinking with, was a megaphone tour guide working for a big company and always tossed the uniform hat on the bar counter with absolute contempt the second she got to the bar. I'm going south, kiddo, she told me, shaking her head. Her bottle was already empty. No good things happening here right now. You always say that, I retorted, slapping down a bill on the counter. The ghost of a smile appeared on her face, and she waited until a second beer was cracked open before she continued. Yeah? This time, I mean it. It's not just the tourists anymore. Not after today. Her brows furrowed, and she looked down, avoiding my eyes. People might call me crazy around these parts for what I'm about to say. I'm not one of them. That same half smile. I know you ain't, which is why I'm telling you. The other day when I was out, I found a whale, and it was dead. I raised one eyebrow. Not sounding crazy yet. Roberta shifted in a seat. It didn't look right. It looked... Well, it didn't look like any other dead whale I've ever seen before. It was half eaten away, chunks of it just floating. The top half was all rotted. It sank to high heaven, but the bottom half of it looked fresh. Hours fresh. It doesn't make any sense. She took a swig from her beer, half empty. You're going to tell me I drink too much. You're going to say that I had a bad day, but when I was out there, I was frightened. Something was wrong. I got the hell out of there, and when I got back... She fumbled her phone out of her pocket, swiped, then paused to look at the picture in front of her, before turning it around to me. Look. I pulled the phone closer to me, squinting. It was a photo of Jeannie's boat, but there were strange patches on the bottom. The boat had rusted in spiral, erratic patterns that sprawled across the boat like ancient writing. I looked closer and realized it was burned in. Something had eaten away at the hull. All right, that is weird. Roberta shuddered and pulled a jacket over her shoulders. I'm not going back. Not after that. Something that can kill a whale that size and get through the hull of a ship. Where did you see it? The thought of losing one of my only friends in this town had sobered me up almost instantly. About three miles out, close to the caves. I straightened up. All right, I'll check it out tomorrow night after the last rounds. She looked like she would ask me not to for a moment, then sighed and turned away. Just be careful, kiddo. The breeze was biting the next day. The cold January air drew out fewer customers than usual. And they searched for the whales with red watering eyes. Esker swam doggedly beside us, always at a distance, but there was no playfulness in her gait. The northern lights were beginning to dapple the horizon when I dropped off my last boatload on the shore and headed back to where Roberta had seen the dead whale. Esker plodded along with me. The only breaks in the lapping of the ice-cold waves were the sound of foam spray in the air as she breathed. It was almost dark when I reached the carcass, and I noticed Esker had pulled away from the boat. I didn't blame her. Whales are sensitive creatures, and seeing the dead 
is never a pleasant sight. I whistled under my breath. It was two halves of the same whale, split down the middle, half rotten, half fresh. I shivered and looked up to the lights above me. In the strange half-light, they seemed to flicker like candles, if candles were a thousand different colours. They danced across the water, and I closed my eyes for a moment. A piercing whale call cut through the quiet. My eyes shot open. The same soft glow was above me, but now it was around me as well, curling around the boat and dipping into the water. The surface of the ocean shimmered and cleared. For a moment, it felt like I was floating. The water was so clear, I could see the depths. I could see the strange, luminous fish that swam there. I craned my eyes and realized that the glowing wasn't coming from the fish themselves. It reflected off them and fractured into light beams. There was a light at the bottom of the ocean. A strange pod, spherical, pulsated like an embryotic sack. It floated, tendrils moving with the tide, the same holographic glisten as the northern lights above me. The light beams hit the bottom of my boat, and I was thrown to the deck with the force of it. I scrambled to my feet, looking overboard, and saw the light eating into the hull, dissolving it. No, not dissolving it, aging it. The spots of my boat looked like the hull of a ship 20 years without repair, and I desperately turned the engines on. They sputtered, choked. Come on, I whispered. Mechanical creaks cracked like whips through the cold air, and I listened as the engine whirred one last time, then died. I scrambled to the emergency radio, and it crackled in my hand. Come on! There was nothing but static. I heard it clatter to the floor faintly. My ears were ringing as the blood rushed to my head. I stared across the great expanse of the ocean in horror. There was nobody coming to save me. There was nothing that could reach me in time. Then, I heard the familiar echo of Eska as she circled the boat. The light cast a shadow, and it wrapped around the hull like a cloak. She nudged the side of the boat, and I felt her skin scrape against it. She had never been this close to me, and in my fear, I felt comforted that I wasn't alone. She circled still, growing ever closer to me, and I held my hand up and let it skim above the water. Inches apart, I felt a warmth rise from the water. Eska turned and looked at me. The iridescent lights in the sky dappled across the water, but I could see her intelligent eyes meet mine. My breath misted out in front of me, and for a moment, there was silence. Then, Eska turned and dived. For a moment, I was scared, alone, until I realized she wasn't swimming away from the light. She was swimming towards it. Clumps of the luminescent pod clung to her as she went further down, closer, and I could see the lesions it created. It melted through her tough hide like acid. But still, I saw her tail scoop into the ocean and drive her deeper and deeper. The light from the pod from the tendrils grew until it was almost blinding. I saw Eska's mouth open as it cracked at the seams. Her jawbone poked through the tatters of her skin. Then, it snapped shut over the pod 
and the water was plunged into complete darkness. I was alone in the boat as it rocked gently from side to side. I know why Esker was one of 30 whales last year whose death was unidentified. The corpses were decomposed, floating, irretrievable. An unusual mortality event has been declared and everyone is searching for answers. But they won't believe mine. I've told my story a thousand times and nobody ever listens. There is something down there and something tells me they are protecting us from it. Three died in Shetland, two in Orkney just a few months ago. It is spreading and I don't know how long they can keep it away. This all began when I was a kid, back when I used to think that the moon followed me. I'd watch it pass through the clouds as my mother drove her aging sedan down the dark highways, always keeping pace with her erratic turns and speed changes, never falling behind. I'd watch it through the rear window, bouncing from treetop to treetop in time with my bounces in the back seat tagging along as the car leapt potholes and divots on the midnight country roads where we sent gravel and dust billowing out behind us. I was an only child and homeschooled, if it could be called that at all, by my single mother in a one-bedroom apartment. She raised me on a shoestring budget consisting of money collected by panhandling, selling herself and selling drugs among other things. It wasn't a very nurturing environment, and there was next to no stability. We were constantly evicted. I was constantly hungry. There was nobody around to provide stability, least of all other children. There was little normalcy or escape from the loneliness, living as we did, sealed in a secret box that my mother had constructed for us. The only friend I had at all was the moon. Staring out at the night sky, the bright city would wash out the darkness and paint it hues of the glowing orange of artificial light that shone from every direction. Void of wishing stars, the moon was all alone above the city that was killing starlight. It stood to reason that if I couldn't see the million of other tiny lights that surrounded it above, it couldn't see them either. So we too, forlorn and lonely, were both in spaces filled with hope we couldn't tap. It seemed natural that I'd be drawn to its cold light in the night for comfort. I thought we seemed so alike, the world around us blaring with so much fluorescence and we hid among shadows. Before long, the moon began to visit me. It would wait until the rest of the world was fast asleep and dip down from the sky to tap on the glass of my window and I would let it in. The moon was tall in stature. It stooped to avoid the ceiling when it came and was always dressed in tailored suits of black. Its round, cratered face would bounce its light from the walls of my bedroom. We'd talk about our dreams, and it would entertain me with elaborate dances of its odd brand of humour. They were mostly corny jokes. What did the moon say to the therapist? It might ask. I don't know, I would say, keeping my voice in hushed tones. I'm just going through a phase... Its shout and its laughter would fill my head and shake the walls. I had to keep my voice low as to not wake my mother, were she home those nights. 
the moon would laugh and carry on at extraordinary volumes, and nobody near would ever hear it or be the wiser for it. It told me, because it lacked a face and mouth, it spoke to me from inside. I alone was hearing the voice in my head. Before long, I grew older and grew out of needing the moon in the ways I once did. The ways I needed it for comfort when I was young and scared. I came to accept that our interactions were mostly flights of fancy, and when I decided to leave my mother's apartment at 16, I never looked back. By this time, I understood the moon was nothing more than an imaginary friend, and though it still continued to follow me in the night sky, it stopped coming down to visit as frequently. I wish I could say I broke the cycle the moment I left my mother's house. I wish I could say I haven't struggled with drugs. I wish I could say I haven't sold my body to strange men. But the world is unfriendly. It's dark and cruel. Living on the streets, inside your head, the world feels like midnight, even in the day. Imaginary friend or no, the moon still found me in my darkest moments. It reassured me that it was still my friend, and we too were lonely in our bond. When I thought I might not have the strength to continue, the moon would urge me to carry on. I began to turn my life around in my early twenties. Sort of. Mostly, I just became better at hiding my faults. The moon came to me and told me how to do it. It was out of character for him to present himself in the daylight, but not unheard of. I sat on the cold ground of an alley, spinning in the throes of ecstasy, the needle still hanging from my arm. Broken glass glittering in the rising sun, shattered beer bottles of green and brown set alight by the sunrise like diamonds pocked with imperfection. A rustling came from the dumpster nearby, and out from beneath crawled the moon. Its spindly limbs struggled as it clawed for purchase. Articulated wrongly, it bent and contorted itself as it emerged, legs first, then torso, and finally, arms. It pulled its head from beneath the heavy steel bin last, its large, round orb lifting it as it came sending the dumpster crashing loudly to the ground as it was pulled free. It rearranged itself before floating forward to me. Sharp hands tilted my chin, lifting my face, caressing my cheek. What are you doing here, idiot child? It asked. I simply shrugged in reply. There was nothing to say. I knew it had been watching me this entire time. That was why it had come now, after all. It helped me to my feet and plucked the needle, crushing it underfoot and squared my shoulders before slapping my face hard. I thought it was the moon. I remember the moon saving me in that alley. I learned later that it might not have been the moon at all, but a nurse, a woman named Gloria, and she says she hadn't slapped me. I'd fallen forward and landed face first on the dirty asphalt. Gloria worked at the local LGBT homeless shelter. She helped me get a little better than I was. I'm still getting better. Just a little bit every day. That's what I say. I'm a rare case. I was overdosing when she found me and rushed me to the hospital. There are hundreds of LGBT youth not as lucky, turnaways whose families have shut their doors to them. I began working days and taking classes at night. I wanted to give back. My goal was to become a counsellor at the very place that helped me find the means to change, or at least the means to project myself as changed to the world. I'm... Not sure how I got to the ocean. The last thing I remembered was being asleep in my bed. I dreamt of power tools. 
I dreamt of blood. I think something bad happened. I didn't do it though. There are a lot of bad people in the world, and I was in their company once, but I'm a good person now. I recycle, I pay my taxes, I help kids who are like me. I'm not perfect, but who is? Occasionally, I might still dabble, but I'm not addicted. Not by a long shot. Not anymore. It's recreational now. No dependency. I still have so few friends, and it's so much harder now to get the moon to come sit and watch Netflix with me. Sometimes, if I get a little high, I can see him again. I can feel whole again. I've kicked the addiction, though. I promise. I heard something over the roar of the waves at the inlet. It was muffled. It sounded like a small voice. You're a turd. It sounded like Craig's voice, but for Craig to call me a turd, if it weren't so impossibly ironic, was audacious. Then memories flitted back to me. Not whole memories, mind you, but pieces. Something bad happened. I wasn't in my right mind, but I assure you, he got what was coming to him. Sobriety is a difficult road to stay on. Sometimes you veer from it. Sometimes you find yourself back in familiar alleys that you should have learned to avoid. I didn't do what I did because I was high. It was a slip up. A tiny slip up. I didn't even start this at all. I was asleep. It was the moon. We'd been friends for so long. I never imagined he might kill someone. But Craig was there, and then the moon was there, and I had to protect myself. I promise you, if I make it through this, I'm done. I'm done with the drugs, and done with the moon once and for all. I just wanted to break the cycle. I was slowly rising above it, and now I'm down in it once again. You're a turd, the voice said again, louder this time. No one else was around. Who could have said it? Hey, you! His voice broke out, a shrill phantom, shivering through the chilly air of March. It had been quiet on my walk out here, and startled. When I heard his voice, I dropped the bundles I'd been carrying to the ground. They scattered haphazardly at my feet, with seven hollow thumps. I looked around. Wondering who else it could have been. How? Who spoke those words in his voice when there was no other soul around? Me? I whispered. Yes, you. The voice said again from near my feet. Stop being a turd. I knelt down next to the collection of garbage bags and hissed. Shut up, you horrible sack of crap. There was no way he could be speaking at all. Craig was well and truly dead. I'd seen that for sure. I kicked the black plastic hefty I supposed might hold his head. It was hard to tell which parts were in which bags in the dark. As I walked out to this place, the clouds had blown in from offshore like waves in the sky, and I remember the weather report predicted rain. I could smell it swirling down from the starless heights as it commingled with the salt that rose from the black waters of the sea. I could not hear what I was supposed to do next. The moon wasn't coming back down. It came down to help me with the first part of this, but then it had gone back to the sky. It was speaking to me, but its voice was garbled, obscured by clouds. If I just had one more. No, that's how addicts think. The moon is my friend. It has been forever. It talked to me before the drugs. I should still be able to hear it, clouds or not. I really just want to go home and back to bed. You will never get away with this, turd. 
said Craig's head. It wasn't me, I insisted. You were going to hurt me. The moon did this to you. You saw it. You screamed when you saw it. I guess, said Craig, through layers of opaque polythene. He was rummaging through my things in the dark. He shouldn't have been in my house at all. I woke up when he screamed, just in time to see the moon pressing its form out through the wall behind me. I shouldn't have been in your house, sure, but times were rough. What was that thing? The moon, I replied casually. No, it wasn't. That didn't look like the moon at all, he insisted. I don't know what to tell you then, asshole. That's what the moon looks like, I said. I only saw the moon. Well, you didn't have to get the skill saw out, he said. They're going to find you, and you're going to fry. I looked up and begged the sky for a roll of duct tape. I should have taped him quiet. I ignored him as well as I was able to, but he kept on. The post-mortem screwdriver in my eye was pretty extreme too. From my lower periphery, I could see the bag clearly now. Moving, plastic pressed against his mouth. Craig resembled some sort of macabre puppet. A dark moving silhouette within the bag of neck and head. Shut up, I shouted at the bag on the ground. Why were you in my house in the first place? Thought I might get something I might be able to hawk, he said. I don't have a lot of scratch right now. I have enough trouble hiding my addiction without helping fuel yours, I thought, but kept it to myself. Nobody could know. Not even stupid Craig. There wasn't anything he could do about any of this now. Maybe I just didn't want to listen to him deny he had a problem. He continued. A jury's going to send you straight to hell. I'll save you a spot, Thomas Vale. Don't say my name, I hissed. Someone might hear you. Thomas Vale, Thomas Vale. Hey everybody, Thomas Vale. I'm dead from that guy. I stomped on the back with my heel and he let out a yelp. I said shut up. He needed to be quiet. I didn't know what to do next. And with the clouds billowing above and his stupid garbage face, I couldn't hear the moon. Please tell me what to do next, I called out. It only told me to come here. It didn't say what to do after. Thomas Vale the turd. You're a turd, I said. You leave empty garbage cans at the curb and play music too loud. He snorted. He called me Grandpa Turd. I chucked all seven of the garbage bags that held him into the inlet. I started with the head and I could hear him gurgling out insults on his way down. Screw you, Craig. Eat crap in your watery grave. But it was a mistake. I didn't realise until too late when the sky cleared and the moon spoke once again in my head. They'll find him there, it said. You'll have to dive down and fish him out. There is a kayak in the bushes ahead. I can't believe you, I shouted back. You wait until now? Don't make me show you my dark side, it replied. Then it laughed at its own joke. I'm not going to dive down there and get all wet, I muttered to myself. I didn't think I was speaking loud enough for the moon to hear. This is crazy. I heard the moon laughing again before it replied. Crazy? You might even call it lunacy? Get it? Shut up, stupid moon. They'll find him there on Sunday, the moon said again. Dive down. Pull him out. You are meant to take the canoe and row him out a bit. That would have been nice to know moments ago. But now, I was just about done with this business. No, I wasn't swimming. I was staying dry. I was going home. I headed back to my car instead. Irony is a little cow when she rears her head.
because just as I came in range for my fob to unlock my door, it began to pour. Go back, it said in my head. No, I replied. I'm done listening to you. Go away. I put my elbows in the steering wheel and cradled my head. I want to change, I said. Change? It taunted. I'd help you, but I've only got a quarter. Then it laughed again. Get it? A quarter. Screw all of them. My asshat, prowler neighbor Craig, and the drugs, and the moon, for leading me to this. I decided to drive myself to the police station instead. Well, maybe I will. I sat there for a while to think. I might just go home. Who even knows if the moon is right? Besides, I'm about to cut the moon out of my life for good anyway. God, I needed something to take off the edge just for a little while. I can't do that anymore though. I don't know what's real when I'm using. The urges always get worse when coming down. Is any of this real? It has to be. I saw the things the moon did to Craig when it climbed down from the wall. Craig saw it too. He even screamed. Maybe they'll never find Craig. And if they do, maybe I'll be able to fake insanity well enough to convince a jury. Art is held, in the dulled hands of humanity, as something priceless. Its worth exists in a constant whir of opinion, coupled together by the feelings of those who turn their eyes to it. Real art, the world would argue, is raw. It has power beyond its existence, has the ability to reach out from beyond the press of glass and frame, to grab at parts of ourselves that we keep locked up, to feed the things we have no choice but to starve. The naked things, the disfigured things. Art, when allowed to be real, is given domain over us, given the ability to change the way we survive. Sometimes it is hard to tell the difference between the choices we make for ourselves and the choices that art makes for us. Sometimes, I wonder if there really is a difference between the two at all. I don't know the limits of art, if there are any limits to what it can achieve, what it can prompt. All I know is that, at the heart of the misfortune I suffered as a child, there was one piece of artwork in particular. Artwork, in the traditional sense of the word. A painting. The painting was a gift, or it wasn't. It had been a part of the house long before we lived there, or it had been something we'd brought along with us. It was placed on the wall at the top of the stairs, against the greying wallpaper. It had been clothed with a gilded frame, bathed in the thin, yellow light carved into the ceiling above. What was the painting of? Well. It was of something grotesquely beautiful, something uncomfortable, its proportions uncertain and jagged, something unknown but recognisable, something with a great deal of bright, blank colour. It was truly a piece of art, priceless when you looked at it, nothing when you looked away. My own mother detested it at first. She begged my father to take it down, said that it made her feel sick, unsafe. My father refused, a little guiltily, a little gleefully, because it scared her, terrified her, that painting. And there was a part of him that wanted her to be afraid, just a little afraid. It kept her quieter, kept her from meandering out of line. 
he didn't even have to raise a hand. He let the painting hang itself at the top of the stairs, even though he despised it just as much. I was only young then, no more than six. And yet, I knew that much. I'd catch him sometimes, standing at the top of the stairs, glaring up at the canvas, mouth working silently around mute words, perverse, abhorrent, pulling at the corner of his mouth, making the muscle twitch and bounce beneath the wrinkled skin. I even had the suspicion that he hated it more than my mother. I don't remember what I thought of the painting in the beginning. I knew it was something more than it was, but it didn't quite hold me prisoner in the same way it did my parents. I think I, mostly, avoided it. And it was happy to let me slip by, small and unfocused, for a while. Until a few years had passed, and the painting's grip grew stronger. My parents' marriage was decaying, collapsing from the inside out. It had been a tremulous structure to begin with, their relationship. A thin built on the thin, deformed legs of fear and necessity. My father was a large, irritable man, with no real talent, but enough brain to know he needed a stable flow of money. My mother was a small, needling woman, with a great bundle of ability, but an inability to do anything alone. I was the poor, pale nail that held the whole sham together, and as I grew, the hole I'd been hammering into began to strain and splinter around me. The marriage was going to burst, was going to tear itself. It would have been easier if they'd divorced, if they'd given up and let me flounder in the sudden sea of change their parting would have ushered in. Instead, I was stuck in no man's land, watching them pelt each other again and again with a rapid shower of insults and threats that quickly escalated to petty, cruel blinks of violence. There was no shelter for me in their war. The arguments they used to have were so common and so inane that they blur together now. There is no particular argument that stands out, except for one. Their last one. The one that started over a discrepancy in my mother's shift timetable and ended with a sudden whispered threat. That painting has to go, she seethed, hands slammed down on the dinner table. I forked at my pasta, cold on my plate, watching her with wide, quiet eyes. I won't look at it any longer, John. I won't. It has to go. My father stared back at her, tiny eyes blinking fast behind his spectacles. He'd fallen quiet in his confusion, left without words for the first time in a long time. The painting on the stairs? He asked, incredulous. My mother nodded harshly, not quite willing to raise her eyes to his. I hate it. You know I hate it. It's been there for years, my father bristled, thrown to his feet in his own spell of exasperation. You don't mind it anymore. I do, my mother dared. I do mind it. You tricked me, told me it would be fine. But it's not. It's not fine. It's... The voices were only rising, and neither registered when I slipped off my chair and scampered up the stairs to my bedroom. When passing the painting, I remember trying hard not to look at it, suddenly aware of its size, its weight. It looked too big to be on the wall, too heavy. It would fall down, I knew it, and if I was unlucky enough to be around when it happened, it would crush me. The next morning, when the sun came whittling through the gauzy glaze of clouds in the sky, it was as if the argument had never happened. 
The painting remained, and so did my parents, glancing bitterly at each other over breakfast. I rushed myself off down the hill to the school, leaving my parents alone in that house together. They didn't argue about the painting again, not because either had changed their minds, no, because sometime that afternoon, my father killed himself. My mother was out working when it happened, so I came home to see it, to see him, hanging at the top of the stairs. I stared and stared, unsure. I cried, perhaps, or I screamed. When I finally tore my eyes away and managed to blink, there were police there with me, gently holding my shoulders, assuring me that everything would be alright. Everything. Everything. The painting stared out from behind my father's back as he swung there, and I wondered why it had never truly scared me before. My mother was quiet after that. There was a funeral, a black clad, stifling sort of affair. I carried on with life as deftly as I could, but there was something stunted in me. The world, which before had seemed so vast and interesting, was suddenly a lot more still. And the painting, I hated it. I would spit at it as I walked by, would glower and sneer, until it started to glower and sneer back. I could feel the heat pulsate off it as I walked by, I could feel the warped horror of it against my skin when I passed it. I moved my room to the ground floor in the end, just so I wouldn't have to ever be within its reach. My mother's opinion, however, had undertaken a radical transformation. The painting had redeemed itself somehow in her eyes. It was a masterpiece, she told me. A priceless possession. It was around that time that one of the neighborhood boys came over to play. Most children on the street avoided me, as if death was contagious. As if the boy without a father would, if you looked at him too long, take your father too, and then the whole street would be fatherless. But this little boy was different. He was a few years younger than I was, shy and uncertain, always trembling and stuttering. His eyes were big and blue, mouth always quivering. He had a name that reminded me of my grandfather, but... I don't remember it now. We played together in my room for a while, making up stories and slotting ourselves into new lives, forcing the air around us to become whatever we wanted it to be. Eventually, when we'd grown hungry enough, we ventured out into the kitchen for dinner. My mother was out at work, so we set about feeding ourselves, pulling pots and pans from the cupboard, bread and cheese from the pantry. Is your mother always out? The boy asked me after we fixed ourselves some horrifically mangled meal. We were sitting across from each other at the dinner table, hunched over large china plates. I swung my legs beneath me, shrugging. Uh, she has to work. There it was then. Death. My father. The blackened moment of my life I never spoke about. The thing that kept the others away from me. The boy only glanced at me, softly, curiously, like he couldn't quite comprehend it. With some clever, gentle prodding, he somehow managed to weasel his way into a conversation about my father. It was the first time I'd spoken about it. It came out in a stunted, stupid rush of words. How I'd known my parents were unhappy. How I knew that that fight was something different. It had been about the painting after all. The painting? The boy asked. I stilled, 
uneasy. I set my food down. My brain broiled at the thought of it. But I showed it to him anyway. We stood at the top of the stairs, staring up at it. It was the first time in a long time that I dared to look it head on. There was a furious, uneasy pull growing inside my stomach. It's just a painting, I tried, feebly, as I glanced over to the boy. The boy met my eye, grinning stupidly. I blinked, feeling unbalanced. Something about his smile didn't quite match the moment, the air. It's just a painting, but they argued about it all the time, I continued. You're joking, the boy accused, that grin still on his face. I shook my head, irritated. My mother likes it now, though, if you can believe it. The boy's smile trembled and simmered away, skin blanching. His hands curled into small fists at his sides. I think I'm going to go home, he whispered, dropping his gaze. I frowned. But I need to go, he repeated, turning and tumbling back down the stairs. I followed him, calling out his name. Walt, or Whitney, or something similarly grey. But he was already putting on his coat, grabbing his shoes. I let him go standing at the bottom of the stairs, watching his back out the front door until he completely disappeared. I told her when she came home that night. I hated it. The painting. I couldn't stand it. She had to take it away or I'd go crazy. My mother only stared, quiet and thin-lipped, until I'd finished my rant, finished my screaming, she sat me down, rubbed a hand on my back, told me I needed to calm down, needed to get some sleep, stop staying up so late. The painting was just a painting, she said, and she'd grown fond of it. It reminded her of my father. The anger only got worse. My mother and I hardly spoke. When we did, we fought. I stopped avoiding the painting, started to confront it. Soon, I couldn't tell who I was more angry with, my mother, or that hideous, disgusting mesh of a painting. I think, I told it one day, glaring up at it defiantly, I think it would be best if you both went, you and my mother. I can't stand either one of you. Something in that painting cracked. Then, move with a writhing, jerky elegance. I took a step back, watched as it stilled again. I rubbed my eyes, convinced I'd imagined it. It was ridiculous, the longer I thought about it, that I hated the painting. It was only a painting after all. I stormed back downstairs, shoulders hunched, retreated to my room. I curled up under the covers and waited for something. Something I knew was coming. Something I couldn't quite see, couldn't quite comprehend. I found her beneath a painting the next morning. Scarlet webbing from her upturned wrists. The blade was on the wood of the stairs beside her, glistening with rusted, ruby pearls. Her face was pulled into a soft grimace, a whisper of pain. I stared and stared. Once again, there were officers, policemen, telling me to come with them, that I was safe. The next month, was a blur of police and suits, of tears and consolations and relatives I'd never met before. My aunt took care of me as things, 
beyond my control, was straightened out. I stayed with her in a little seaside house, far away from the town. My mother had a funeral too. I cried and hugged her and told her goodbye. Wished she could listen, wondered if she would, hoped she couldn't, as I continued to tell her I knew it was my fault, that I was sorry. My aunt and her daughter took delicate care of me. I began to look at the world with newfound interest. I began to run again, began to play, befriend others. I ate more, talked more. I carried my grief with childish promise, with sudden clarity. The days I'd spent in my old home, with my mother and my father and that painting, it all seemed far down the tunnel, blurred and incomplete. I'd been so vague and stiff then. I never spoke of my time in that town, until the day came when I went to collect my things from the house. My aunt and cousin came along, holding my hands, sheltering me between them. But there was no need for any sort of comfort. The town, in which had been so stony and flat in my mind, was startlingly normal and bright. The house was less suffocating. My aunt carried out my things from my bedroom, whilst I showed my cousin around. It was only then that I remembered the painting, that I caught it looking at me from the corner of my eye. My legs churned to a stop. My cousin, following behind me, slowed, frowned. What's wrong? she asked. I kept my gaze focused on the ground, steered towards the stairs. I just had to look at it. One more time. Just once more. My cousin followed me up, side by side, step by step, until we were standing beneath it, that hulking, bubbling blister of a painting, the thing that I couldn't bring myself to hate any longer, couldn't trick myself into loving. I used to hate it, I muttered towing at the wood of the stairs beneath us. My cousin was silent beside me, tipping her head up to look at the painting. I had a flash of panic, worried she would run off like that boy did eons ago. But she just stared, lips pressed together in that tolerant, straightforward way of hers. My mother hated it first, I explained. I still hadn't looked at it, hadn't dared. I slowly, surely, crept my eyes up to look at it. It looked back, grinning. It had missed me. It had been waiting. I shut my eyes back down. My dad hated it too. We all hated it until we didn't. I don't know why, it was just a painting. There was a long silence. What painting? I stopped, peeked at my cousin, trying to understand what sort of joke she was starting. The one in front of us, I insisted, unsure. Afraid to look at it. I pointed at it though, pointing at the breathing swath of canvas on the wall. That's not a painting, my cousin said, blunt, naively unbothered, vaguely confused. Yes, it is, I argued, still behind on the joke. No, she said. No. That's just a mirror. And when I looked up, I saw it too. The flat patch of reflective glass. 
the gilded frame around it. I saw our pale faces in it, staring down at ourselves, our matching brown eyes, our open mouths. The hate evaporated into sudden, dizzy confusion. It had been there. I had just seen it. I couldn't have just imagined it. It wasn't possible, because I'd seen it. We'd all seen it. My mother, my father, me. My cousin tugged at my hand, gentle. I think we should go. I nodded, stiffly. Let her lead me back down the stairs, back out of the house. We sat on the doorstep, together, talking in the dry heat of the afternoon sun. Neither of us brought up what we'd seen, what had happened, whatever it was that had happened. Finally, my aunt emerged, smiling and asking if we were ready to go home. Home. We rode away in silence. My aunt asked me if I was alright, if I was hungry or thirsty, I wanted to see anyone before we left. I told her I was fine. I never went back to the town. I never saw it again. I grew up with my aunt, letting her rear me into something stabler, something closer to the line of normal. I let myself grow into something that could face the world without the apathy that had strung itself into the very air I'd breathed as a child. I let myself forget the memories of my parents, my poor parents, and what they'd done to themselves, to each other. But I have nightmares still of that painting. I could never see it, never remember what it looked like. I thought it to be best to put it out there, to tell the story as it happened, to see if it would make me feel better at all. It has certainly given me some clarity, some relief. Maybe, perhaps, there'll be a day where I can sleep without seeing it. But there is a deeper truth than that. I'm not just saying this to heal. I'm telling this because I don't want to forget. No matter how cruel and twisted the memories are, I don't want to wake up and find that I can't remember it at all, even if I want to. Because sometimes, when I'm alone at night, I wonder if there'll be a time where the memory will cease to exist. Just like the painting itself, that when I look for it, I'll find something else entirely. And maybe it always was. The image you all saw came from a vastly sophisticated scientific collaboration called the Event Horizon Telescope. This project involved over 200 scientists in 20 different countries that have been working together for nearly a decade. I am one of those scientists. The black hole we pictured was at the center of the Messier 87 galaxy, about 55 million light years away. It's an understatement to say we were excited. Imagine how much resources this all cost, the politics that had to be juggled to maintain the working relationship between all the countries involved, the internal fights about theories and proposed ideas. It wasn't easy, but we succeeded. So, it was heartbreaking when we decided not to show the public what we found. What is circulating in news articles and social media is fake. To understand everything, first, 
one has to understand what a black hole is. It isn't just some hole punched void like they are in cartoons, somehow a flat disk existing in our 3D space. The dark spot shown in the picture is also surrounded in a flare of light. To put it simply, a black hole is black because of a singularity or a region where the very fabric of time and space has collapsed in on itself, forming a single point with infinite density. It is just as grand as you can imagine. If you know anything about gravity and its relation to density, then you can imagine how powerful the gravity is at that single point. Light coming from behind and in front is swallowed up when it gets too close. It's swallowed and effectively removed from the universe. But then, why is the ring brighter than the perceivable light around it? This part is harder to simplify, but I will try. The innermost edge where the light starts isn't actually the event horizon. It's known as the photon orbit. Its diameter is about two and a half times larger than where the event horizon starts, meaning the black hole is even smaller than what you probably thought it was at first glance. We can see the moon because light bounces off of it. However, light sadly doesn't make it when heading to a black hole. The light ring is an interesting story. Simply put, the sheer gravity of the black hole warps light close by. Light, fortunate enough to not get swallowed, but unfortunate enough to be affected, is shot around and carried on a trajectory dictated by the curve of the black hole's gravity. To picture it, imagine how water curves when you turn on the tap and it hits the back of a spoon. That's what we're seeing, the white splash of the water, which silhouettes the spoon, showing us it exists, but never being able to see the spoon. Everything had to go right for this image to exist. There had to be some radiation emanating around the black hole, and it had to have a direct path to Earth, without any celestial object knocking it off course. Eight observatories all over the world had to sync up their clocks perfectly to an absurdly specific degree. Everything had to be perfect. And it was. At least, that's how far public knowledge goes. Because if you see the real image, the quality was much higher. We weren't apprehensive at first. Our desire to relish in our achievement trumped our thoughts of concern. We sent it around the various other labs involved in the collaboration, telling them not to share it, but letting them bask in the glow of victory. We are told in a number of press that we might have something to show, and we were in the process of putting together a press release, when we were interrupted with a reply from a concerned scientist. He simply told us to look closer. The message's lack of detail puts us on edge. A common sentiment is when a scientist finds something we tend to go overboard in details. It's in our nature. The blunt message made us apprehensive, and we took it as a serious tone to slow down. We took to the scans and decided to explore the closer details, something we were planning on doing together after getting approval from the board. Checking the perimeter, we saw nothing out of place. It was what we expected various degrees of heat picked up by the radio telescope, the temperatures represented by the shades of colour. By seeing nothing, mutters of confusion murmured around the lab. We looked again, nothing. We looked again, nothing. A cycle which we were used to, repetitive testing being in our nature. It wasn't until the voice of stupidity spoke up that we tried something different. 
Why don't you try looking in the middle? A lot of us scoffed. It was a black hole. It was mathematically impossible for anything to be in the middle. If there was, it'd be a speck on the sheet or a glitch on the computer. The whole point of the experiment was to see the black hole by not seeing it, by using the silhouette of the light to show its whereabouts. So, when we did decide to humour the request and ran a number of filters, we all froze when something stood out. Theories were spat out in hushed conversations. Some thought we didn't catch a black hole, but some other space anomaly. Others thought this proved that there was a problem with the sensors, and that our decades of research was a failure. We would have went along with any of these theories, if something didn't stand out. The fact that the shape resembled something. Random smears, sure, it could be played off as a sensor problem or a glitch, but it wasn't random. A space anomaly would be believable if we weren't 100% sure we were aimed at the right section of the Messier 87 galaxy, exactly where the black hole should have been. This had to have been a picture of the black hole. So, the question that lingered in the silence was, why was there something in the middle? There were a few specks of white and gleams of jagged angles that outlined something so alien, but with a feeling of familiarity. There was no doubting that what we were seeing was the front of a face. None of us could come to a consensus of what it truly looked like though. Some said it vaguely resembled an animalistic creature, eyes and a jagged mouth. Some thought it looked vaguely human. You would think the uncertainty would have eased us into thinking we were simply imagining it. But no matter who we asked, everyone claimed to see a face. A face that was perfectly centered big enough to demand its own faint outline of light, which meant it was cosmically big. That it had a gravity field that could curve light. This is where things started to feel grim. It was in the center, big enough to be detected by our radio telescope, but so in line with the black hole that it didn't disturb as much as a pixel of the outer ring's light. It was centered, which we all agreed, made it look like it was staring directly back at us. Our collective hearts sank when we all came to the same realization. It was looking towards Earth. Not only that, but from its faint outline, we determined it was moving. It was heading towards Earth. The black hole is 55 million light years away, which meant that what we saw was a snapshot of the distant past, from an era where dinosaurs ruled. But there is no solace knowing this is from the past, because that only meant that whatever it was has had a head start. It saw Earth many millions of years ago, and took it upon itself to come this way. We don't know how close it was when it was pictured. We don't know how fast it can move. We have no idea the true scale of the beast. We do not have any ideas of what it wants. But it wants something from us and it has been traveling for millions of years to get it. Everyone involved in the Event Horizon project has been sworn to secrecy. We were immediately ordered to create a fake image to satiate the press, one based on the original, but of a much lower quality, as to show the world the worth of space research, but giving them nothing to be worried about. 
Funds are being organized from some countries, extorted from others, at a rapid pace for more research. Nothing is being held back. All of our worldly perceptions have been altered. Some scientists have disappeared, choosing to stay at home to be with their families, while others have chosen to practically live at the lab, desperate to find out a grain of information from this vast beach of a mystery. We have not given up, and neither should you. Be aware, but not scared. And maybe find some humor in the fact that a space force may not have been such a bad idea after all.